Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day three of market design, of economic engineering, but focusing on market design today and again on Tuesday. And that'll be our final class. And in our final class, we'll look at uh, applications of market design. Uh, but for this morning to get us woken up and ready for the rest of the day, for me, at 7 a.m. in Del Mar, I know it's 4 p.m. in uh, Cologne, but um, I need to wake up. So I'll do some start with some math and then we'll talk about applications in the second half of the class uh, or, to, or tomorrow. Actually, we're gonna do math all day today, I think. Uh, tomorrow will be applications. So you'll recall last time we finished um, uh, calculating the equilibrium behavior in a very simple bargaining game with incomplete information, uh, which I call split the difference trading, where both seller and buyer have private information about their valuation and they simultaneously, um, the seller makes an offer, the buyer makes a bid. And if the seller's offer is below the buyer's bid, then they trade and they add a price that's halfway between the offer and the bid. So that split the difference trading. And what we did was we looked at a, the case where both values, S and B, seller and buyer, were uniformly distributed between zero and one. And I've uh, plotted the equilibrium in the graph here. And what it shows is the 45 degree line, which would be if you bid the truth, then you would be bidding right along the 45 degree line. The values are in the domain and the range or the, off, the seller's offer and P and the buyer's bid Q. But because the um, mechanism is structured so that the bid or offer that you make directly impacts the price that you pay, both seller and buyer have an incentive to misrepresent their uh, private information. So this mechanism is definitely not uh, truth dominant. Uh, you do not want to bid your true value. And in particular, our intuition is that sellers want to overstate their value and buyers want to understate. And this is a general intuition that we we always have. Um, and it's, I, it makes, makes a lot of sense. And in fact, as a seller, the, the lower your uh, value, the more you want to overstate. And as a buyer, the higher your value, the, the more you want to understate. And that's seen in this picture. And in fact, uh, what's interesting is when we, uh, as the uh, seller's value increases, the seller overstates less and less and less. And then we get to this point right here where the uh, seller tells, tells the truth. And uh, the reason for that is that at this point, the seller has actually reached the point uh, that the, the highest bid that the seller, that the buyer uh, ever makes. And so at this point, the probability of trade is zero. So there's no, in that trade-off between probability of trade and terms of trade, uh, there's absolutely no incentive to shade your bid because the probability I'm sorry, to overstate for the case of the seller because the probability has fallen to zero. Now, one quick question I have is when I was moving my, my mouse, can you guys see my mouse? Anyone? Everyone's on mute. Do you see my mouse jiggling around? Yes, oh, I see the chat box. Okay, good, thanks. I've got the chat box open too. So that's actually a very useful way to communicate to me as long as it catches my attention. 
Um, so, uh, so, so that's good. And in fact, I can use um, annotations if that's easier to see. We can see, um, let's see, draw, stamp, uh, highlight. Maybe I'll try that. Um, well, let's see. Oh, good. Okay, there, now you can see something that's even brighter, I think, than my mouse. And I think it stays, uh, which is nice. <clears throat> okay, so this is the equilibrium in this game. And in fact, what we showed is that it is not the unique equilibrium, it is the unique linear equilibrium. So if I, um, uh, uh, consider among all the equilibria, there's a continuum of equilibria, but when we look at this continuum of equilibria, one of them is going to be linear. And uh, that's simply because we have the uniform distribution. If we didn't, if we had some other probability distribution other than uniform, there would be no linear equilibrium. Um, so that's just some uh, very nice feature of the uniform distribution coupled with uh, risk neutrality. Um, you've got at least a fighting chance that you might have a linear equilibrium, which is very easy to compute. Okay, so uh, so one of the interesting things here is that the uh, equilibrium is inefficient. In fact, we only end up trading in circumstances where the gains from trade, B minus S, is bigger than a quarter. Uh, and all other cases, we don't trade. Uh, so we get an efficiency. And I concluded yesterday's class with uh, arguing that, um, well, maybe that's just because Chatterjee and Samuelson uh, studied a bad game and that the, 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 you know, maybe there's other game forms, bargaining games we could have played that would have resulted in more efficient trade. So to figure out whether that's the case and to figure out what is the, the best trading game we could play, um, we're going to need a much more powerful technology. You know, so far, what we did was we just cal directly calculated what the equilibrium was in the game. But what we need is a technology that enables us to look at the incentives of the problem, analyze them generally, and consider all possible game forms with this particular structure. And um, that, that is uh, seller and buyer uh, values private information. And that technology uh, fortunately does exist and it is um, mechanism design. So now what we're going to do is uh, try to understand the incentives in this trading game uh, in a very general way. Um, and of course, this doesn't just apply to bargaining games, it applies to auctions, it applies to public good games, uh, essentially uh, all games. So it's a very powerful theory for understanding uh, incentives in games with incomplete information. And invariably, uh, games like uh, bargaining, auctions, public goods, involve uh, some amount of incomplete information. So this was done, this general model was done by Meyerson and Satterthwaite. Um, and uh, we studied the direct revelation game. Uh, so we've got this seller and buyer engaging in trade, each with um, a private value that's independent from the other. And so the seller's value is drawn from this probability distribution F um, with a interval support from S lower bar to S upper bar. And the buyer is values drawn from a probability distribution G with a positive support 
on B lower bar to B upper bar. Um, and, in, and, and actually, it's, it turns out it's important uh, that there's no mass points, that these are, these are continuous probability distributions, uh, that that's actually helpful. And we will make use of that. So the distributions F and G are common knowledge. That's the framework uh, that we had uh, last class. And we will have actually throughout the, well, we're, we're, we're gonna always make that assumption um, even though in practice, of course, that's, uh, that, that's not true, but it's a good way to enable us to do an analysis that makes sense. And this was the big contribution of Hersani in uh, the late 60s to recognize the importance of making that uh, assumption in order to have a tractable analysis. Um, but when we do market design uh, in practice, then we will move beyond the theory and construct mechanisms that are robust to uh, a, a variety of possible distributions and, and you know, recognize that we don't have such a strong basis of common knowledge. But for uh, analyzing the games, it really is essential. So in this uh, direct revelation game, the way it works is the, the market participants, in this case, the seller and the buyer are going to simultaneously report their private information, uh, S and B. And the mechanism then is gonna take these reports, S and B, uh, and uh, map them into a probability of trade P and a terms of trade X. So P is a function of S and B and X is a function of S and B. And that's what the direct revelation game is. Um, so there it is. P of S comma B being the probability of trade given the reports uh, that the parties made and X of S comma B being the expected payment from buyer to seller. So you can think of the uh, mechanism designer as simply an algorithm uh, that uh, accepts the, the reports S and B and then uh, performs uh, a, a settlement, um, both financial and uh, physically of, with the good. So that's how it works. <clears throat> so the first place to start is figuring out what their payoffs are. And we start with their ex post payoffs sort of after all information is revealed, what does the seller get ex post? And this is uh, simply because we're, we're gonna continue assuming quasi-linear utility that, that there's no uh, risk aversion. Uh, your payoff is linear in money and the good. And so your payoff is going to be uh, X of S comma B, the payment that you receive from the buyer minus with probability P S comma B, you actually have to give up the good. So you lose the good and the good is worth S to you. So we subtract S times P. And similarly for the buyer, uh, the buyer's ex post payoff is just with probability P, they get the good, which is worth B. So that's B times P. And then we of course have to subtract out the payment that the buyer makes to the seller. Now notice that this payment X of S comma B doesn't necessarily depend upon whether uh, the good was um, uh, went from seller to buyer. Uh, most mechanisms you think of you only make a payment in the event that the trade takes place. That certainly is allowed here. That's one possibility, but we don't need to assume that. We can, this is very general. Any uh, payment rule is possible, at least initially before we impose some conditions. <clears throat> okay, well, the players, when they uh, make an offer, when the seller makes an offer, the buyer makes a bid, then 
they're uh, in this interim state where they know their own private information, the seller knows S, the buyer knows B, but they don't know the valuation of the other. And they have to, uh, they do know the probability distribution, but as a result, they need to calculate their, what I call their interim uh, payoff, which is simply each trader taking the expectation with over what they don't know, which is what the other's value is. And so it's gonna be very useful to calculate the expected payment from uh, the buyer to the seller um, from the point of view of a seller with valuation S. That's the payment that the seller expects to receive when their valuation is uh, S. Um, and so, so, so here we're just taking, uh, we're just integrating over all the uh, buyer types from B lower bar to B upper bar, the uh, X post payment X. And the density of course is uh, G for the buyer. And we do the same thing for the, the buyer, integrating over all seller types, S lower bar to S upper bar and the seller's distribution is F. And similarly, we do the same thing for the probability of trade. So if I'm a seller with a value of S, then the probability that I will get, that, that I will um, pass the good to the buyer is just integrating P of S comma B over all buyer types. And same thing for the buyer. So it's very convenient to break, to, to do this uh, uh, split up into the, the payment and the probability of trade for both seller and buyer, um, because then we can write down in a very simple, separable way the uh, interim payoff for seller and buyer. So in particular then, the seller's interim payoff, U of S, is just going to be their expected uh, payment, X of S, minus S times P of S, where I'm using the um, capital letters for these expectations that the, the interim, the, in the interim state you'll notice that it was before it was lowercase uh, U and V for the ex post payoff, but now it's capital U and V for the interim payoff. And similarly for the buyer, uh, the buyer with probability Q of B is going to get the good, which is worth B, uh, but they're having to make the payment Y of B to the seller. Okay, so the um, not all possible trading mechanisms um, will have desirable properties. And in particular, we're especially interested in those trading mechanisms that are incentive compatible, that induce the uh, traders to truthfully report their private information. Uh, and we say the mechanism is incentive compatible if for all uh, seller types, uh, S and B, and all alternative uh, seller types, S prime and B prime, which you can think of as misrepresentations potentially, it's the case that you do not want to uh, misrepresent. So it's gotta be the case that the utility that the seller gets by truthfully reporting U of S is greater than or equal to what they get by lying. And here, the seller is lying, but even though their true value is S, they're lying and saying S prime. And what they get then is they're going to get the, pay, the expected payment as if they uh, have value S prime, so X of S prime minus 
Well, they're also, they've also affected the probability of trade. The probability of trade now, which depends only on the reports, not on their actual values. So the probability of trade now is P of S prime. But notice we have S here. So we're subtracting out P of S prime, probability of trade, times S, their true value. Uh, because of course, that's what the seller cares about, their true value. They can't, just because I lied and said my value was S prime doesn't make my value S prime, my value is still S. So having that S there is extremely important. Um, but it's very nice because this, you can see it's got a beautiful structure. Uh, this interim payoff when I lie is linear in the probability of trade. And that's going to be very important. That's going to enable us to characterize incentive compatibility in a very uh, elegant uh, and easy way. And we have the same thing for the buyer. The buyer, when they report B, uh, will get V of B. And that has to be at least as big as what they get when they lie and report uh, B prime. And what do they get when they report B prime? Well, they get their true value B minus the, the, the now uh, probability that's been distorted by the lie Q of B prime uh, minus the expected payment, which also has been distorted by the lie uh, Y of B prime. Okay, so that's incentive compatibility. And uh, wonderful thing is with the uh, uh, Quasi-linear utility, the risk-neutral bidders, we um, we have the uh, interim payoff is uh, uh, as a function of my private information is uh, linear in the probability of trade. Uh, very important. Now, the other thing that we want is individual rationality. We can't force people to play the mechanism. We, um, so we have to set up the mechanism so that every type of player wants to play the game. And uh, that's individual rationality. So their, their uh, interim payoff, U of S for the seller and V of B for the buyer has to be greater than or equal to zero. And that has to hold for all seller types and all buyer types. Now these two conditions, incentive compatibility and individual rationality mean, you know, first that the mechanism is consistent with voluntary participation. And second, it's consistent with the uh, traders um, ability to lie about their private information. So incentive compatibility has us respecting their ability to lie. Individual rationality has us respecting their voluntary participation. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do is characterize the mechanisms that are incentive compatible and individually rational that, that basically respect uh, voluntary participation and uh, the incentive to lie. And the, the reason we're going to, uh, to focus on those is because in fact, any Bayesian game we have them play uh, will also have to, I mean, it doesn't have to be truth dominant, but every equilibrium can, uh, of that Bayesian game can be restated as an incentive compatible and individually rational mechanism. And that's the uh, direct revelation uh, idea that uh, without loss of generality, we can focus on, when we're looking at all trading games uh, with this information structure, uh, we uh, can effectively look at all trading games and all equilibrium of these trading games by looking at the class of uh, incentive compatible individual rational mechanisms. So the first thing we have to do is characterize incentive compatibility. That's step one. Uh, and this was done first by Merrilies, for which he received the Nobel Prize quite some time ago, and at, uh, right about the same time by Meyerson in his optimal 
auction paper for which he received the Nobel Prize. Um, and it's incredibly simple. So this is again consistent with the notion that, that you get the Nobel Prize for doing things first that are really simple and really powerful that basically everybody needs to do yeah, to you know, finds useful in their, in their life. And this is one of those things. So the characterization is that a mechanism PX is incentive compatible if and only if the interim payoff of the seller is decreasing, the, I'm sorry, the interim probability of trade is decreasing the interim probability of trade for the buyer is increasing. And it's the case that the interim utility is um, simply calculated by integrating the probability of trade uh, up to a constant. And the constant of integration is the utility of the, um, the worst off type, which in the seller's case is S upper bar and is B lower bar in the case of the buyer. But they both have this structure, just the integral of the probability of trade, um, starting with the lowest buyer type, B lower bar, up all the way up to B, the, you're integrating the interim probability of trade uh, Q to determine the buyer's interim payoff and similarly for the seller. Now, the why is this, why did I say that the S upper bar was the worst off um, seller type and B lower bar the worst off buyer type? Well, the reason is it's quite intuitive. So basically what's gonna happen in this, in this mechanism is in order to make it incentive compatible, we're going to have to uh, reward people for telling the truth. And rewarding people means giving them extra money. But there's one party that we don't have to give extra money to tell the truth. And that is the seller at the upper end of the distribution, S upper bar. As I said, sellers want to overstate, buyers want to understate, and S upper bar can't overstate. They're at the top of the distribution. So they can't say, well, my value is S upper bar plus 0.1. No, you can't do that. Uh, because I know that no one has a value higher than S upper bar. And so that's why that seller is the worst off because the mechanism doesn't have to give them anything extra for being honest. And similarly, buyers want to understate the guy who's the worst off is B lower bar, the type of buyer that can't uh, lie. They'd like to say their value is B lower bar minus 0.1, but they can't because nobody's got a value below B lower bar. So we can give that guy zero. And same thing for S upper bar, they can be given zero in, in the mechanism. And in an optimal mechanism, uh, that's exactly what would happen. Okay, so that's the very nice characterization. So let's go ahead and, and prove it. It's extremely easy to prove. Uh, just follows directly from the definitions and recognizing uh, the linearity of uh, interim payoff uh, on the probability of trade. So it's as simple as that. So here is so we just write down the definition. So U of S, uh, this is the definition of the, uh, you know, falls immediately from the definition. And so if I was instead to, uh, so, so the utility, if I had a value of S prime, then this would be my uh, interim payoff. And now, uh, this definition and incentive compatibility implies that uh, U of S has to be greater than or equal to, well, uh, this, that's incentive compatibility. But if I just substitute in what, uh, X of, uh, what U of S prime is, 
and get rid of the, uh, the x's, in doing so, then I get uh, this. Now these two inequalities I can put together as I have done here. And you basically I've, uh, uh, when I'm looking at this difference between U of S and U of S prime, I've sandwiched it between uh, this probability of trade and this probability of trade uh, times S prime minus S. Now, if we take, if we divide, um, let's assume uh, without loss of generality that S prime is bigger than S. So, um, so it happens to be positive. Um, I divide um, this inequality through by S prime minus S and take the limit as S prime goes to S. And then what I have is I've sandwiched the derivative of uh, u between um, uh, p of s and p of s. They both in the limit. They're both p of s. They're both the same thing. So the derivative of interim utility, actually it's u of s minus u, u of s prime. So this is minus the derivative of u. So minus the derivative of u is equal to p of s. Okay, that's what I, what I just did. And then we just use the fundamental theorem of calculus, integrating the derivative uh, to uh, get uh, the incentive compatibility IC prime condition. Okay, and which, sorry, which gives us this. Okay, the utility is just integrating the probability of trade uh, up to the constant of integration, which is from the fundamental theor theorem of calculus. Once I know that the derivative for the seller, seller's interim utility is minus P and for the buyer it's plus P, plus Q. <clears throat> okay, so that's uh, the only if direction. Now the if direction, because this is an if and only if, it's a full characterization. The if direction, I have to prove incentive compatibility for the, uh, so I want to prove incentive compatibility for the seller. And uh, to show that, I need to show that, uh, that, that, that this is true. That's just the inequality, equivalent inequality for incentive compatibility. But now I can substitute in for x of s prime and x of s using ic prime, which I'm allowed to assume um, because that's the if part. Um, and so, uh, so this is the um, expression for x of s. And so I just substitute it in here and here and do, uh, some simplification. So lots of terms cancel out and I'm left with, um, in the end, with this. Okay, P of T, it's just, this is just a little simple algebra, which is not why I'm not going through it. It's, it's a, if you can solve a linear equation, you can do this. Um, so what is this? Uh, so now I need to sign this P of T minus P of S prime, um, where S is, where, where T, the, cons, the, um, uh, the, the, the dummy, uh, the dummy of integration is bigger than S prime. Okay, and what do we know? We know that uh, P is decreasing. So when I put in t's that are bigger than s prime, then what happens is this is going to be negative because this is decreasing. And we do the exact same thing for the buyer. 
So the monotonicity um, of the interim probability of trade, the interim probability of trade is of, uh, of central importance. So you, you can't have, a, you can't propose a mechanism and expect it to work if uh, that monotonicity is violated. Then they would definitely have an incentive to misrepresent. Okay, so now we've got lemma one all, all proved. That was uh, not too bad. Um, now the second lemma is to characterize the incentive compatible and individually rational mechanisms. Um, so now we wanna, how can we characterize individual rationality for incentive compatible mechanisms? Well, that is super easy uh, because now we just, rather than all trader types have to be made better off, well, we actually only have to check one point. Is the worst guy better off participating in the mechanism? And that is U is U of S upper bar greater than or equal to zero. If the answer is yes, then everybody else is better off participating in the mechanism because interim utility is um, well, well, for the, the, the case of uh, the um, seller is uh, strictly uh, decreasing. So the guy who's worst off is going to be S upper bar. And similarly for the buyer, B lower bar. Interim utility is strictly increasing. And so we just need to check to make sure that the uh, lowest buyer type, B lower bar, is uh, has a payoff greater than or equal to zero. And then we're done. So, so now we can put these two together and characterize incentive compatible and individual, individual rational mechanisms uh, in this trading environment. And the characterization is, is very simple. An incentive compatible individual rational mechanism satisfies this inequality, uh, which is a statement of the uh, interim utility that the worst off seller type and the worst off buyer type get has to be greater than or equal to zero. And the, um, so this might look like a big mess, but what are we doing? So if we just, if we ignore these terms with the distribution here, the one minus G over little g and the uh, F over F. So just ignore those terms for a minute. Then what this would be is just B minus S, which is gains from trade. And we're just taking the gains from trade, multiplying by the probability of trade and integrating over seller types and buyer types. So it just would be, if we ignored these terms, it would just be uh, the expected gains from trade that are realized by the mechanism. So that's pretty neat, uh, but we've, we're subtracting these terms. Uh, and what are these terms that depend upon the distributions? Well, they're basically the information rents that we have to pay to buyer and seller in order to induce them to be honest. So it's the, the, the fact that we've got this private information, we're having to bribe people to be honest and we've got to make sure that we've, that. The, the, the mechanism is creating value through the gains from trade, B minus S, but we have to make sure that the incentive problem isn't so severe that our payments, our bribes to get them to be honest, uh, don't exceed um, the gains from trade. So I've only got so much money to work with, which is the gains from trade that the mechanism creates. And uh, the whether or not a mechanism is you know in an incentive compatible and individual rational mechanism, it's going to be the case that the um, uh, that the the sum of the payoffs of the worst off types has to of course be greater than or equal to zero to satisfy individual rationality, and. This is basically saying that, that uh, okay, we've got enough money to bribe everybody, uh, all the sellers and all the buyers. 
as long as the, their payoffs are greater than or equal to zero. The worst off types get uh, greater than or equal to zero. So that's what it, that's the intuition. Now let's prove it. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Okay, I'll I'll push forward. So now this part, it's it actually um, it's it's pretty easy. I just use lemma one and lemma two, and uh, then. The big trick here, the big insight is that essentially it's an accounting problem. Now, once you've characterized incentive compatibility and interval rationality, which was super easy, now I just have an accounting problem. Do I have enough money to make the bribes that are required? And how much the bribes are is going to depend upon the probability distributions. And um, and then I'm just seeing if, if the you know, total bribes, um, do the total bribes exceed the um, gains from the expected gains from trade that's created? If the answer is uh, no, then we're okay. If the answer is yes, then uh, unfortunately we're, uh, the, the, the mechanism isn't uh, incentive compatible and individual rational. <clears throat> okay. So, so first, uh, we're going to use, and, and actually, one of the interesting things to note about this is the, this X doesn't appear anywhere, right? This is just all about the probability of trade. So how is it that X doesn't appear? Well, it's because by the characterization of uh, incentive compatibility, the X, at least the expected X when we integrate it over the seller type or the buyer type is uh, uniquely defined by the starting point, however much I give the worst off seller type or the worst off buyer type, then every, every other payment, there's only one incentive compatible uh, expected payment. And so that's why it's disappeared. It, it's sufficient to uh, just do everything in terms of the probability of trade. So in other words, you can give me a probability of trade P of S comma B, and I can tell you whether that P of S comma B is consistent with a um, incentive compatible individually rational mechanism. And all I do is use the incentive compatibility characterization to determine what the uh, interim payoffs, um, the interim payments have to be. Okay. So what we're gonna do is, um, just write down what the uh, expected payment is um, that, that, that's going from um, buyer to seller in terms of uh, from the seller's point of view. Okay, that's this X of S and we'll do the same thing for, um, so, so, lo so let me just go ahead and, and calculate that. And we're gonna, then we'll do the same thing for the buyer. Okay, so, but, but, but here all we're, we're doing is just substituting in to uh, this uh, expression for the payment, which follows directly from incentive compatibility, all right? This is just, uh, you know, from, from incentive compatibility. Um, so, now let's take the expectation of that with respect to S. Okay, and why am I so 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 then this is going to be the expected payment that the seller receives from the buyer uh, integrating now over all seller types. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm going to be able to do the exact same thing for the buyer, and then it's going to be the case, and this is where we're using the accounting, then we have the accounting identity that the expected payment from buyer to seller 
is equal to the expected payment from buyer to seller. Uh, you know, one way I calculated from um, the seller's perspective and the other from the buyer's perspective, but those two have to be equal. Money is not created or destroyed. It is uh, simply transferred between the two. Okay, so then I can set those two things equal to each other. And when I do that, I, I can set them equal to each other and then, um, and then just uh, solve, as you'll see. Okay, so uh, the, the only slightly tricky thing is in this third term, uh, how I got that uh, capital F, um, but that just follows by uh, performing the integration. So all I did here, so this is the thing I had to integrate, and then I changed the order of integration uh, so that I could integrate at little f. And the integral of little f is going to be big F. Uh, but so that's what I wanted to do. But in order, order to do that, I had to change the order of integration. And then boom, it, uh, it's the easiest thing. It's super easy to in integrate a density function. Uh, it's its distribution. And it's, that's, those are the sort of tricks that, that, we're, that we use. So basically that and integration by parts. And uh, so it's basically changing the order of integration and integrating by parts. Those are the two hardest things that we do in this whole uh, uh, proof. Otherwise, and a little bit of algebra. Okay, and as I said, we're gonna do the exact same thing for the buyer. But notice that this thing is, of course, equal to what we just did for the seller. So then we're going to be able to set them equal to each other. Okay, and that gives me this. And the, they're not perfectly uh, symmetric, seller and buyer, um, but it's close. That's why I get this one minus the dent, one minus the distribution rather than just the distribution. And that's why you have the you know, increasing and decreasing for seller and buyer with respect to the uh, interim probability trade and interim utilities. Um, they're analogous, but not uh, uh, symmetric. Okay. So now we're gonna just equate these two things. And when we, when we equate them, actually I didn't even write it down. So once you equate them, then you, you can solve for u of s upper bar and v of lobe upper bar, and you get this. And all it is is flipping and shuffling. So that's why I don't do that. Just a little bit of algebra. And then what about this greater than or equal to zero? Well, of course it's greater than or equal to zero because by individual rationality, this is greater than or equal to zero and this is greater than or equal to zero. So of course the sum of two things that are greater than or equal to zero is greater than or equal to zero. So we're all done. So that's the beautiful characterization of incentive compatible individually rational mechanisms in the case of bilateral trade, one seller and one buyer, each with private information about values. Uh, we can do the exact same thing for auctions. Um, so, uh, and, and actually in the auction class we will, uh, not in this class. Um, and we can do the same thing, and it's just as easy. We can do the same thing for public goods problems. So you give me some sort of game with incomplete information, some framework of, with uh, uh, incomplete information, and I can, you know, as long as the big things I needed were um, independent private values, uh, so that was useful, and uh, quasi-linear utility. If you give me those things, I can, uh, and you can easily, um, have these very wonderful characterizations of uh, all incentive compatible and rational mechanisms, which is basically anything that can be achieved with some trading game or some public goods game uh, that respects voluntary participation and um, the fundamental property of uh, private information, which is your ability to lie. Now I should say that, you know, when I talked about the car uh, on our first class, 
um, I said that sometimes society steps in and makes rules against lying. And you can have rules against lying if you have ex post observability. So that's another way to solve informational problems is you have ex post observability. Um, so in the event something's ever challenged, we can just look and see what the facts are. And every reasonable person would agree that, well, this is, this is your cost or this is your value. Um, and so then we don't have to hand out the bribes. But if it's something that really is private to you and there's no way to have uh, ex post verification, then we're gonna have to make it incentive compatible. Okay, and a lot of things are just fundamentally unknowable. You know, like how, how do I value the painting that's behind me? Uh, I mean, are you going to be able to prove in court that that painting is not worth a lot to me? Ed, come on, I mean, that's my, uh, it's just my own, only I know what the value is. Okay. So that brings us to the, uh, an immediate corollary, uh, which is a very important theorem in uh, mechanism design and especially in uh, trading environments. And that's the impossibility of efficient trade. So, and this is what, this is Meyerson and Satterthwaite's um, main conclusion in their, in their famous paper. And I'm gonna state it, they didn't state it like this, but this is the, I think the nicest way to state it. If it's not common knowledge that gains exist, that is if the support of the traders valuations have some non-empty intersection, uh, so that the highest uh, seller type is above the lowest buyer type, so if the probability distributions are separate, so all the sellers are here and all the buyers are here, then it's actually a piece of cake to figure out um, an efficient trading rule. All we need to do is trade with probability one at a price that's between the highest seller type and the lowest buyer type, right? So, um, you know, if sellers are between zero and one and buyers are between uh, two and three, then any price between uh, one and two uh, will be a price that all trading types can trade with probability one. So for example, we could split the difference and trade at 1.5 with probability one. It is incentive compatible, right? Nobody's got an incentive to misrepresent because the terms of trade don't depend on, pri on private information. Uh, it is individually rational. Everybody, every type of every player is uh, benefiting from the mechanism. So what this theorem says is that in the event that somehow rather than our distributions looking like this, the distributions cross. So there's some uncertainty about whether gains from trade exist. Even if that uncertainty is tiny, so they just overlap a teeny bit, then it's no longer possible to have efficient trade in an incentive compatible individual rational trading mechanism. Okay, ex post efficiency is impossible. And that is a very important uh, Theorem. And the reason it's so important, and really it's just a corollary of the characterization, which is why I call it a corollary, uh, you'll, I'll prove it in a second. The reason it's so important is it provides a, uh, a very plausible reason why it's sometimes difficult for parties to come to agreement. So it means that private information about values not only makes it challenging to come to agreement, it makes it an, an efficient agreement. It makes it impossible. 
Um, so we're going to have to have some bargaining inefficiencies. As soon as we admit that um, there might possibly not be gains from trade. And so that's very important in the bargaining context. Now it turns out when we look at auctions, uh, which is, um, so, so this is a two-sided, the bargaining is a two-sided problem where, where both buyer and seller are actively engaged in the, uh, the bidding process. But if we look at auctions, one-sided auctions, we've got one seller and many buyers, uh, then there are mechanisms that are fully efficient. Um, in particular, any of the standard auctions, well, if it was symmetry, but I mean, let's just say so an English auction in which the seller sets a reserve price uh, of zero, uh, is assuming their value is zero, is going to be um, efficient. But that was, but that actually required that the seller not be actively involved in the bidding process. Suppose instead we've got a situation where the seller has some cost uh, or some value of the item for themselves, uh, S, and that's private information. Then in that case, there isn't an efficient auction. No, no efficient auction exists because the mechanism designer has to elicit um, my, re my reservation price uh, and, you know, or my value S and they, they like to force me to set a reserve price of S but they can't because I can lie about S. If they can't verify what S is then um, the auction environment's going to be uh, inefficient because I will have an incentive to uh, set a reserve price that's above my actual value. So, you know, this is stated for bargaining, but it applies equally well to any trading environment where there's private information uh, uh, on both the sell side and the buy side. Okay, so let's see if we can improve this. So the reason it's a corollary of the characterization is we just, the proof is completely mechanical. We just plug in the uh, ex post efficient probability of trade. Uh, we know what that is. It's you trade if and only if S is less than or equal to B. All ex post efficient trading rules have this P of S, P of S comma B. And my characterization from before, if we just jump back, there's my characterization. So all I have to do is plug in uh, this ex post efficient P of S. So this is gonna be one for all realizations where S is less than or equal to B, it's gonna be zero for all other realizations. And that's going to give me an expression here that just depends upon the distributions. It only depends upon the distributions once I've, because I've specified that what this is exactly. And so now I just have to see um, whether or not this thing is greater than or equal to zero. And it's going to turn out that it doesn't actually matter what the distributions are. It's always gonna be less than zero as long as um, B lower bar is uh, less than S upper bar. As long as we have that intersection, uh, I'm able to sign for any distribution G and F. Okay, but it's but it's going to follow. It's not going to follow by some you know amazingly complex thing. It's just going to follow from doing the um, arithmetic, you know, changing the order of integration, integrating by parts a couple times, and we're done. Now I suspect what happened was Meyerson and Satterthwaite looked at a few examples. You know, let's try the uniform distribution. Uh, and that where they can do everything easily, explicitly, and they found out that 
well, it doesn't make any difference. As long as the supports overlap, uh, I'm gonna get, I get something that's negative. And then they said, okay, well, that was the uniform distribution. Let's try the uh, Pareto distribution. You know, let's try just some the beta distribution. And my guess is they just plugged in other distributions and they, they got the same result. And then they said, well, maybe there's a theorem here. Okay. Um, and let, so let's go ahead and prove it. Um, I don't know, maybe they're so brilliant uh, that they could just see it right away. But if I was to do it, I would first do some examples and see it holds true in every example I could think of. And then I would uh, say, okay, well, now let me struggle and see if I can't do the arithmetic to uh, actually prove it. Okay, so this is step one. We, we plug in and now, now here I plugged it in. Okay, so all we have to do is sign this. Um, I've just plugged in P of, S, P of S B equals one, if and only if uh, S is less than or equal to B to give me this expression for star. Um, and uh, so now let's go through the arithmetic. So, so this is just uh, fleshing out, just separating the terms and the two components, the stuff that involves um, the buyer and the stuff that involves the seller. Um, and once I split that up, then here I'm just carrying down what's here. Um, here, I'm actually able to do this integration. Um, and I, but I have to use integration by parts. Um, and that shouldn't be that surprising because when we do integration by parts, I think I've got it here. Yeah. So, you know, integration by parts is nothing more than, um, uh, taking what, what we probably all remember, the derivative of a product is that, so if I, I'm, I'm taking the derivative of uh, uh, u times v, then the derivative of that product is going to be uh, u prime v plus v prime u. And all integration by parts is, is, is sort of recognizing, okay, we can just flip and shuffle that with the integrals and, um, and, and get the formula for, uh, for uh, integration by parts. And when uh, we're working with distribution and densities, um, you, you should almost remember that, that uh, this is very basic uh, and immediate integration by parts. Um, and so all I'm doing is taking this and, uh, okay, there it is right there. S times the density plus the distribution. You know, anytime you see something like that, you, you should get really excited. It's like, oh boy, I'm gonna do integration by parts uh, because I know that this is true. Okay, so, so this is actually fairly obvious to, to those that, uh, and we're, we're gonna, you'll see this in all these problems that we do. As I said, it doesn't matter whether it's bargaining, auctions, public goods, whatever it is, uh, you'll always have this integration by parts step. Um, and then I just do some more um, brute force simplification here. I cancel out, I'm able to cancel out some, some uh, identical terms from this here and this here. And that leaves me with this. And then this thing, you know, again, I get really excited because I see this uh, integral with the uh, uh, G of B. And again, I can do this by parts to uh, express it like this. And then I can combine these two Okay, now they both have the one minus the distribution and I'm left with this. Okay, which is one minus the distribution time for the buyer, one minus, I'm sorry, the, the, the distribution for the seller. So what do we know about distributions? Well, this is greater than or equal to zero 
and this is greater than or equal to zero. So I got these two things that are greater than or equal to zero. I've got a minus sign here. So this thing is, is going to be uh, less than or equal to zero. Um, but now, since I'm integrating over, actually for all, um, this is, you know, except for at the uh, uh, endpoint, uh, B upper, B lower bar and S upper bar, this is, uh, these are going to be positive. So this is, uh, both are positive. So at their, their, and the minus sign, this is going to be strictly negative. Uh, as long as we're integrating over a positive uh, region. And we are, because we started with the assumption that B lower bar is less than S upper bar. Okay, so we're, we're integrating this positive thing over a positive interval, and it's got this minus sign, so the whole thing's less than zero. So I've signed it for all distributions. So that's very nice. Now, implicit in this was that um, there were no mass points. And so we are, we are definitely making use of the, uh, the smooth uh, densities and, and the smooth distributions that have a density. Uh, so that, you know, that's a limiting assumption, but really in, uh, for, for lots of applications like here, it's, uh, it's very natural. There's no obvious reasons why there's mass points on the, uh, the distribution. Okay, now this enables us to uh, do a little bit more. So now that we found that we can't do the first best, we can't get ex post efficiency, that would be the first best outcome. There must be a second best. What's the best we can do? Um, and uh, this gives us the methodology. We, we simply um, have now a way to mathematically optimize to find the ex ante efficient trading rule that maximizes expected gains from trade subject to incentive compatibility and individual rationality. And so let's do that now. Uh, and this is actually, this is again, extremely easy to do with a little bit of calculus. Uh, so there's nothing fancy here. And it's also quite intuitive. Um, right, that, the, that there should be the second best and, and we've, we, we've, we've got now well-structured, our characterization of incentive compatibility and rationality is so simply structured. I just have that, right, that's, that's a single uh, inequality, that star prime, right, that the uh, u of s upper bar plus v of low bar per bar is greater than or equal to zero. We had that formula for what u of s upper bar and v lower bar were uh, when added together. So we just take that formula and put it right there and then maximize. So, so now I'm, I'm basically, I'm choosing p of s comma b. So ignore the payments x because that's of no interest. All I want to do is figure out what the best probability of trade is, and then the payments will follow immediately from incentive compatibility up to a constant. But, but here, our constants are, are going to be zero in both cases, because we can't do the first best. So in the second best, I definitely want to give the worst off seller type and the worst off buyer type zero. So they're both going to get zero for sure. I'm not going to give them any extra money. And then I have to figure out, well, how do I have to distort trade away from the efficient trade in order to uh, make sure we don't lose, um, in, in order to make sure we don't make it too difficult to have trade. And what I'm gonna do is also very intuitive. I'm basically going to uh, wipe out 
any potential gains from the really bad types. So, so, so the really low um, buyer types and the really high seller types, I'm gonna make them all get zero uh, by setting the probability of trade equal to zero in those instances. And that's gonna reduce the quantity of bribes that I have to pay. And if I do that enough, I will have uh, found, uh, I, I will um, satisfy uh, the constraint of incentive compatibility and individual rationality. And I will have found the uh, second best mechanism. Okay, so that's what we're doing. So, so it's, you know, quite intuitive. It's very simple. Um, and uh, it does involve a fair amount of algebra, but, but that's basically it. Um, because, because really, and, and it actually isn't too much algebra. Because um, really what we're going to do is what economists love to do, which is, so this is maximize this object. I'm going to choose P of S comma B to maximize this subject to that uh, uh, constraint star prime. And what do economists love to do to solve the maximization? Well, you form the Lagrangian by putting the constraint uh, upstairs. And now you've got a, uh, you know, effectively unconstrained uh, optimization. And how do you solve that? Um, you know, typically you take the der derivative and set it equal to zero and so on. Well, this is going to be so is even easier uh, because I'm choosing this P of S comma B, this function, and I'm going to be able to, I'm going to be able to do this um, by what's called pointwise optimization. So essentially, I will just look at the uh, look at the uh, uh, Lagrangian, and that Lagrangian um, is just this big integral, this big double integral over all seller types and all buyer types. And I will just look at the integrand, and wherever the integrand is positive. I'll set P of S equal to one, S comma B equal to one. And wherever it is negative, I'll set it equal to zero. And that's all we're gonna do. And as long as the distributions F and G are well behaved, then um, we'll find out that the P of S comma B that I get is going to, uh, be such that it is decreasing, it leads to a decreasing P of S for the seller and an increasing Q of B for the buyer. And then I'm done. Because what I did point wise was obviously sort of the best that one could do because the probabilities have to be between zero and one. So whenever I see something positive, I'm setting it equal to one. Whenever I see something negative, I set it equal to zero. So that's obviously, I can't do better maximization than that. And then I find, I gotta just check to make sure that um, the probability of trade is uh, monotonic in the right way. And the answer is, it is, it is uh, for typical uh, distributions. Now, if I got some really funny distributions, uh, then I would have to do what's called ironing in order to make sure that I preserve the monotonicity. But we're not going to talk about that. That's uh, sort of advanced theoretical topic. But typical distributions, you know, uniform and all the standard distributions you can think exponential, you know, whatever your favorite distribution is, they will all um, uh, lead to th th this solution working. Okay. So and 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 basically, what it turns out is. Uh, This is the uh, uh, second best trading rule uh, that, that in essence, 
Um, and, and Meyerson calls this, the this would be the seller's virtual value, and this would be the buyer's virtual value, which is their true value. In the case of the sellers, it's plus, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna be um, overstating. So now I'm gonna add some extra. And what do I add? I add the inverse hazard rate uh, times a constant. And um, similarly for the buyer, their buyer's virtual value is B minus, what do I subtract? Um, the inverse hazard rate for the um, buyer times a constant, the same constant. And, and the trick now is when, so if alpha was zero, then this would be S and this would be B. And then this P of S comma B would be, um, would just be X post efficiency. And this would say uh, maximize X post gains from trade. Um, but I can't do that. Now, if this was one, so for alpha zero, it's uh, uh, first best. If alpha equals one, what am I doing? Well, I didn't explicitly write it down, but um, I probably should have. But in essence, the Lagrangian of this is uh, for when you set alpha equal to one, um, essentially what you're doing is, well, actually maybe it is clear. Um, when you set alpha equal to one, this is S plus distribution over density, B minus one minus distribution over density. Well, if we go back to what star was, look at this. This is what star is, B minus one minus the distribution over the density. And this is the, for the seller, it's if I put uh, parentheses here, then the, this becomes a plus sign. And this is S plus distribution over density. Okay, so this, when alpha equals one, what I'm doing is I'm maximizing uh, this. Okay, so I'm maximizing the constraint. And um, and now my claim is that actually alpha, the, the, the theorem says that alpha equals zero doesn't work. Um, I claim that alpha equals one does work because, you know, for example, I can easily make this greater than or equal to zero. Um, how do I make it greater than or equal to zero? Well, we never trade. Okay, if I set P equal to zero uh, for all SB, then um, clearly um, uh, satisfying this constraint. So the second best has to be between uh, the alpha equals zero, everything is continuous here, has to be uh, between zero and alpha equals zero and alpha equals one. And that's what the calculation is going to do. Okay, so, so essentially the second best is simply gonna find the alpha between zero and one that uh, um, exactly, uh, gives the, 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 the lowest buyer type, um, yeah, the lowest buyer type and the highest seller type exactly zero. Okay, and that's the optimal trading game, uh, which, which we often call the second best. Okay, and that's what I just said. Um, the, uh, notice that the, in the ex ante, this is important, in the ex ante efficient trading rule, um, we have trade with probability one or never. So that, that's gonna be, uh, so, so trade with probability one or not at all. And that's gonna be very interesting if we think about dynamic mechanisms as, uh, uh, you know, for example, in a dynamic mechanism, so typical dynamic bargaining game, you might think 
um, you know, rather than have a uh, probability of trade, let's have a time of trade. And if trade gets delayed, we, um, the, we, we just use discounting of the payoffs. So we discount future payoffs. So that's the cost that we're going to impose rather than having a cost of no trade. Well, what this says is when you look at dynamic trading games, the only thing that they can do is reduce uh, payoffs. Um, and, and this result basically explains that, that if the uh, traders discount future payoffs, um, bargaining over time is just gonna make things worse. It's gonna introduce other incentive constraints. Plus what we really wanna do is make, the, make this sort of all or nothing uh, incentive. Uh, trade with probability one or not at all. We finished our first half this morning by considering, um, by characterizing incentive compatible and direct, um, incentive compatible and individually rational mechanisms in our trading environment. And we showed the very fundamental result that it was not possible to get ex post efficiency whenever there was some uncertainty about whether or not gains from trade existed. And the, uh, this is a powerful motivator for, for why private information might get in the way of ex post efficient trade. Um, and one thing that we can do, and then we looked at, well, what, what is the second best mechanism? What's the mechanism that maximizes gains from trade among all incentive compatible individual rational mechanisms. And you'll remember that I uh, criticized the Chatterjee and Samuelson split the difference trading mechanism as, or I potentially criticized it as, um, you know, it's, it's inefficient. Uh, with the gains from trade have to be at least a quarter in order to have trade when we have the uniform distribution. And that's problematic in a couple different ways, um, but uh, the, the, you know, one of them is that if the traders can't commit to walking away from known gains from trade, then they'd be unable to implement the mechanisms. Now, an algorithm could implement the mechanism so that it doesn't actually, it just says, okay, you guys should trade. Uh, and at, at this particular uh, price, but actually what happens, uh, or the mechanism says you shouldn't trade. Um, but the traders in the event of no trade will have an incentive to continue to trade. Um, so that, that's why dynamic mechanisms are of interest because the, uh, this commitment that's built in, so that would be the, the, the main critique of Chatterjee Samuelson is the split the difference trading. You have to be able to committed to not trading in the event you're instructed by the algorithm not to trade. Um, so, and, 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 and my work actually focused on that. I was interested in dynamic trading mechanisms. And so with people bargaining over time and they wouldn't be finished bargaining until their, uh, the gains from trade were exhausted. They, they, they identified that gains from trade were not possible uh, or that it was just too costly to continue to, to negotiate and then they would stop. But, um, um, so, and, and then I would say that the trading mechanism is sequentially rational, that, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 the mechanism not only is incentive compatible and individually rational, but it also doesn't have commitment built into it. Uh, the parties can continue to negotiate as long as they uh, find it profitable to do so. But what we found is that in, in fact, this mechanism, that the second best mechanism um, isn't like that. And in fact, with the uniform distribution on zero one, the uh, split the difference trading rule is in fact the ex-ante efficient mechanism. So when we do have 
um, uh, symmetry between uh, buyer and seller, the same distributions or the sy symmetric distributions, uh, then uh, the best that they can do is uh, split the difference. So that's uh, an interesting uh, fact that, that Chatterjee and Samuelson just happened to stumble upon um, what is the best uh, mechanism, the second best mechanism in an environment where first best uh, is, is not possible. So we've actually accomplished quite a bit this morning because uh, we just introduced this morning or my morning, your afternoon, um, the mechanism design analysis. And we were able to characterize all Bayesian equilibria of all bargaining games in which uh, players' uh, strategies map their private valuation into a probability of trade and a payment from buyer and seller. And in fact, it's easy to extend, and, and I did this in subsequent work, I extended it to dynamic trading mechanisms in which we just replace the probability of trade, P of S comma B, with a uh, time of trade, T of S comma B, and um, then P of S comma B can be interpreted as just uh, E to the minus R, the, di the discount rate times T of S comma B. Uh, so we're just discounting future payoffs. And then this all, all this analysis applies to the dynamic trading rules as well. We prove that ex post efficiency is unattainable uh, whenever there's uncertainty of uh, whether gains from trade exist. We were able, in the, in the event that the first best wasn't possible, we were able to identify through very simple mathematics the ex ante efficient mechanism that maximizes the uh, gains from trade, which if you are a market maker and you're motivated in, in uh, making gains from trade as large as possible, that would be a natural alternative. And we're able to prove that ex ante efficiency is incompatible with sequential rationality. That is, um, in order to, to achieve the second best, the parties are gonna have to commit to the mechanism. So, that's, that's quite a bit. And that, it, it illustrates the power of uh, mechanism design. And as I said, we can apply it to not just trading environments, but uh, public goods and all, all sorts of things with any, basically any incentive problem involving private information in economics. Uh, very powerful methodology and it's been extended now to uh, settings where um, the quasi-linear assumption is uh, violated. So for example, the, the participants are risk averse and so on. Um, things get more complicated, but it still is very powerful theory. What I wanted to do next is extend um, the analysis in a different way. So still maintain the um, independent private value assumption and still maintain the quasi-linear assumption but now I want to look at environments where the uh, property right is not so asymmetrically held. So one thing about the bargaining problem that Meyerson and Satterthwaite studied is that the incentive to misrepresent is really quite extreme because of the, um, uh, the large difference between seller and a uh, buyer. The, the seller owns the good uh, and all of the good, the buyer owns nothing. Um, and then the incentives to misrepresent are quite strong. Sellers want to overstate, buyers want to understate, and it's that misrepresentation or that incentive to misrepresent that's causing us to uh, be forced to accept some amount of inefficiency. So what I'm going to describe now is an environment where the ownership right is not so asymmetric, but it is ownership is dispersed among all the parties potentially in some 
in, in some known but um, arbitrary way. And uh, then ask the question, how does that affect incentives? So this is work actually that I did with Bob Gibbons and Paul Klemperer uh, when I was a PhD student. Uh, and in fact, the three of us were sharing an office uh, at the Stanford Graduate School of Business at the time. And so in fact, um, um, the, the problem originated when Bob Gibbons got a phone call from uh, one of his classmates uh, at Harvard, who was looking at what the FCC was doing with respect to um, the allocating spectrum. So the FCC um, for forever, basically, it was if you wanted spe radio spectrum, you just applied to the FCC and said, I, wa I want radio spectrum. And they would look at your application and then give you spectrum or not based upon whether they liked it. And what happened was, and that worked fine in the early um, days of radio in the you know, 1930s and uh, the 20s and so on, uh, because there weren't that many people that wanted to use it. So you could just ask and then they would give it to you. Um, but what happened in um, the 60s was um, um, mobile communications was uh, invented. And now there was this application that was in, it just incredibly valuable. Um, and so, it, you know, in the 60s, it was invented and then um, it took a while for it to get, gain momentum. But by the time 1980 rolled around, there was lots of interest in uh, radio spectrum because everybody knew that this was very valuable. And so lots of people were knocking on the FCC's door. Um, and what the FCC did was uh, effectively beauty contests initially where they would look at everybody's proposal and they say, oh, there's too many of you. And so I'm gonna say, I'm gonna select this one and that one, but reject these. And, um, and, and we'd go through this administrative legal process and to determine, to determine who would get what. So the problem with that is it was taking an enormous amount of time. And in fact, such a long time that um, it, was, it was just impossible. Um, we were going to, what, what ultimately led to a change was the fact that they, it was just so slow in, in, in litigated that the US, despite the fact of having invented in the 60s uh, mobile communications, um, Europe was um, moving along faster than we were. And this was unacceptable. So something had to change. So through this whole period, you know, beginning in the late 50s, uh, Ronald Coase was uh, arguing at the FCC, hold spectrum auctions. This stuff is scarce. And when you've got a scarce commodity, the way to allocate it is through an auction. So here's Coase uh, arguing before the FCC, before Congress. He's got this beautiful paper uh, of his testimony before Congress, um, arguing that uh, spectrum auctions makes a great deal of sense, but the FCC didn't do it. And in fact, in 1980, they still uh, uh, didn't do it. So throughout the 80s, where we were starting to, it was catching on and we were starting to fall behind uh, Europe because of our slow administrative process. So they, they, they got the idea, well, we can't do auctions. Yeah, that's, that's too scary. Uh, and I don't know why exactly they couldn't do them because I was completely persuaded by Coase's quite sensible arguments before Congress. Um, but anyway, they couldn't do it. So they, they, did, they had to do something. So what they did was we'll hold a lottery. That was their brilliant idea. Let's hold a lottery. Um, we've got all these applications 
And so we'll just get a ping pong ball for each application. We'll put the ping pong balls in a cage. We'll spin the cage and pull out a ping pong ball. And that will be the person to get the uh, license. So they did this and it was, it was very fast. But what they found was the um, more and more people would apply for uh, a license. And that shouldn't be that surprising because this is an extremely valuable thing that you're getting. And so, you know, I would apply for it. That, this makes a lot of sense. So at the, towards the end, they were getting hundreds of thousands of applications. And the technology that they were using was still, I mean, this wouldn't be a problem if they used computers, but they were still using uh, ping pong balls. And so they would get larger and larger cages for the ping pong balls. And eventually when you're getting hundreds of thousands, ping pong balls are just so big that you run out of space. So what really broke things down for them was the fact that ping pong balls were, were just too big and their randomization device just wouldn't work anymore. And meanwhile, there's, you know, all the economists are screaming, hold an auction, hold an auction. And uh, so eventually um, in 1992, the FCC was granted um, auction authority by Congress and in 1993, the FCC uh, held the first uh, spectrum auction. And from there, it just took off. But this was back in um, 1983 that, that uh, uh, Bob, Paul, and I were, were uh, talking about this. And it was because Bob got this phone call saying, the FCC is doing this crazy thing with ping pong balls. and uh, it seems like there should be something better. And uh, can't you argue that, that the ping pong ball method is really bad? And so th that was the motivation for writing this paper because the ping pong ball is a situation where you, you know everybody, you make an application and then you have an equal share of uh, the, the license. And we're gonna then do this randomization to determine who actually gets the full property right but initially you all have equal share. And our um, analysis uh, suggests that, well, actually a better way is, you know, certainly a, 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 an auction and we can actually replace this ping pong ball method uh, with an auction, even when you've got a fixed set of people that have applied for something uh, and get an efficient outcome. And so that was how we stepped into this. Um, but it turns out to have very broad implications of trading all sorts of commodities um, that the ownership structure is extremely important in the incentives and more balanced ownership structures have much better incentives. Uh, and so uh, you're gonna get closer to the first best or you're going to achieve the first best. And that's what this paper shows. So we imagine a world where we start out with N traders and each of them has some ownership share RI, greater than or equal to zero. And of course the, the ownership shares sum to uh, one. And so Meyerson and Satterthwaite then is a situation where we've got buyer and seller. So, so uh, R1 for the uh, uh, seller is equal to one and R2 for the buyer is equal to zero. Um, and the utility that you get from a partial share is just going to be proportional. So your, your value, if your value is VI and you have your partial share, you get uh, RI times VI. The VIs are going to uh, be drawn IID from the same distribution. So here we're making an additional assumption that there's symmetry in the distributions. That's just uh, uh, for convenience to keep things simple. We don't actually need that, um, but we do need the independent private values. That's very important. And what we're interested in is this, this partner. Now, now, so this structure is basically defined 
uh, we call it a partnership by R, the vector, R1 to Rn of ownership shares and the probability distribution F. Uh, and we wanna ask the question, is it possible to um, have ex post efficiency, to dissolve the partnership efficiently, have the good go to the uh, guy that values it the most? That's what the FCC should have been thinking about. We want the license to go to the party. We've got these N applications. We're gonna give them all equal shares, one over N. And uh, now can we get the license to the guy that values it the most? And the answer is yes, um, which shouldn't be surprising. Um, so this is the Meyerson Satterthwaite case, as I mentioned before, where we've got one zero as the partnership and they, show quite famously that there does not exist any Bayesian equilibrium of a trading game that is um, individually rational and ex post efficient. What we will show is that as long as the ownership shares are not too unequal, then it's possible to achieve ex post efficiency in a incentive compatible, individually rational trading mechanism that satisfies budget balance. Nobody's throwing in extra money. Actually, I should have said that before that if the mechanism designer doesn't have to satisfy budget balance, they can throw in some extra money, then it's easy to calculate with Meyerson and Satterthwaite what the amount of money that you need in order to achieve the first best is. Because basically the problem is you're running out of money to, to make bribes. So if the uh, somebody, you've got a benefactor that throws in some extra money, uh, that can also uh, enable you to achieve uh, ex post efficiency. A partnership can be dissolved efficiently if there exists a Bayesian game of the Bayesian trading game uh, that's individually rational and ex post efficient. And now let's see if we can do this. Uh, so here's the big theorem, uh, the partnership, partnership RF can be dissolved efficiently if and only if this inequality star is satisfied. And this light might look like a mess, but in fact, it's uh, very similar to what was going on with Meyerson and Southwaite in terms of um, the bribes needed to get parties to uh, tell the truth. And then we're summing up over uh, all the uh, players and integrating over all the player types. Um, and essentially, this is the same as that star prime calc uh, inequality that we had before in the bilateral trade uh, setting. It's the same. Now, one thing that's different is this VI star. So this actually replaces the S upper bar and B lower bar as the worst off types. So the, this VI star is the worst off uh, uh, trader, uh, the worst off type of player I in this trading game. <clears throat> and what this is, is um, so, so VI star is going to uh, be the type that uh, satisfies uh, this. And the intuition for it is that this type, this is the type, the worst off type, is the type that doesn't need to be bribed to tell the truth. They're going to tell the truth. They have the incentive to tell the truth, uh, even without a bribe. OK, and S upper bar was that guy in the buyer seller situation, B lower bar as well. And that was because those guys couldn't lie. They had nowhere to go. But what we get once we recognize that ownership can be dispersed is you get these intermediate points. Yes, in the extreme case of seller and buyer, then you get um, um, you, you get this satisfied all the way at, so if this is one, then what is this satisfied for? Well, it's satisfied for uh, V upper bar. 
right? If you're the seller, it's the highest type, the upper bar. If this is zero, uh, when is this satisfied? Satisfied for V lower bar, right? The lowest buyer type is sure, the, the, the lowest trader type, V lower bar is surely a buyer, very strong incentives. So, so if R equals zero, then I'm definitely a buyer. And so um, I'm always a buyer. And so the worst off type is going to be uh, B lower bar. But for if my ownership share is, let's say there's four of us and we have equal share, so my ownership share is one quarter, then it's going to be this intermediate point, uh, somewhere between V lower bar and V upper bar, where um, right in the middle. And in fact, this, it, this uh, equality right here, when, when, when this is satisfied, that's the type that is completely confused about whether they're buying or selling. They're just as likely to be a buyer type, a buyer as a seller. And so you can write down very easily, I won't do it now, but you can write down that their expected um, uh, proceeds as a seller is exactly equal to their expected payment as a, a buyer. So that's why they're, they're right in the middle. They don't know, they're most confused about whether they're gonna be selling or buying. And so they have no incentive to misrepresent. They're in a, a balanced position, just as likely to buy or sell. And if you're in a completely balanced position, then what you wanna do is just tell the truth. Okay, if, you're, if your ownership share is way up here, then you know that you want to overstate and the, the worst off type is uh, the upper bar. If you're just a buyer uh, for sure, then you want to, the, the worst off type is gonna be the lower bar. But if you're somewhere in between, if your ownership share is between zero and one, <clears throat> then there's gonna be this type um, evaluation for you, a, a type for you that's going to put you in a balanced position. And that's what's making you the worst off. Okay. So I'm not going to prove it because it's the proof is basically the same, very similar. Um, we would just go through and uh, do, do the characterization just as Myers and Satterthwaite did. That's what we do in this paper. And then we would find um, that this is the, the inequality that we get. Now, I will plug in an example. So let's go back to the uniform distribution. And so, so let's say everybody has a uniform distribution. And now there's lots of uncertainty because all our, our uh, uniform zero, one, let's say. Um, so all our values are between uh, zero and one. And then for example, if there's just two of us, then when we uh, plug into that formula, we'll find that the uh, range of types for which we can achieve the first best just has to satisfy this inequality. So basically uh, all the way from any partnership where the ownership shares are between 0.21 and 0.79, we can do just fine. It's just these extreme cases that we can't do. And with n equals three, we get this formula. So this is the, the uh, so, so this triangle represents all possible uh, ownership uh, shares. And the whole blue area here we can do is ex post efficient. Just the extremes that we have trouble. Now here is the problem with the FCC's lottery mechanism. So what they're doing is they're taking the N of us have applied um, and now uh, the FCC is getting out the ping pong balls, one ping pong ball for each, we spin the cage, we pull it out, and now we're gonna assign 100% of the ownership to the, the guy with the winning ping pong ball, which is putting us at one of these three points all of which are inefficient. 
So this was our argument to the FCC that in fact, this was really stupid because you were taking a situation where you, you could easily allocate efficiently and instead you're converting it into uh, something that can't be allocated efficiently. And the reason it won't be efficient down here is because the, this is a situation where, you know, let's say I, it's my, I win, I've got the winning ping pong ball. Then now I'm gonna auction off this, this right to the highest bidder, but I'm gonna set a reserve price that's above my, my value. And that's gonna be the source of the inefficiency. Um, so that was the FCC's mistake. Um, and, of, and of course, in 1993, they fixed this and shifted to auctions because they ran out of ping pong balls. Um, the, oh, I do notice in the chat, sorry, I just noticed this uh, from, from Henry, a question, does, the, does the, the, the size of the inefficiency increase with the um, size of the intersection? So if I've got, if I've got sorry, my, my, my seller and buyer here, as we intersect more, does the inefficiency increase? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, so if you take the same distribution and you just um, push those distributions together, then the inefficiency increases, absolutely. So it's very intuitive. And the same thing here, with the fact that we've got the, the cell, all the parties uh, uniform zero one, that's sort of the worst case. So even in this worst case where there's enormous uncertainty about who's got the highest value, um, we're still able to get uh, efficient uh, ex post efficiency, except for these extreme cases. So this can be thought of in some sense as a worst case analysis and we still get full efficiency um, much of the time. Good question. Now, um, so, 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 so this is interesting, and, and of course, there, there's actually another inefficiency that the FCC has created, which is actually a far worse inefficiency. And that is, um, you know, this analysis, I'm taking that there's this fixed set N of guys that have applied. What if we have a situation where people are endogenously deciding to apply? Well, then what happens is the, the, the number that apply is dependent upon the cost of applying and the cost of applying became very cheap. They, to, to apply, you had to uh, <clears throat> do a bunch of engineering stuff, but it turns out these application mills sprung up so that it would be, it's, it was very easy to get all this beautiful engineering done for about $5,000. So it cost basically $5,000 to apply for something that's worth uh, $200 million. Let's say, you know, a license in Boston uh, might be worth $200 million. So um, you're going to get a lot of applications. And that's, that's exactly what happened. So there's basically two costs is this all these applications is complete waste. Um, so you're, you, you've got the, the hundreds of thousands of applications, complete waste. And then on top of that is once you've, you've gotten all the applications, then you make a bad assignment and turn the situation into a situation where um, uh, efficiency is no longer possible. So is bad all the way around. Now, the next thing that we do is, um, well, well, we were able to show that the one owner's partnership can never be dissolved. So that's a, that was a really bad thing. And um, then we show that uh, if the partnership can be dissolved, then it can, we, we provide a trading game, which is an auction, uh, which achieves the uh, efficient, ex post efficient outcome whenever possible. And it basically is just a, um, uh, we take the original problem and we make a payment, a side payment to each party for coming to the mechanism and turning over their ownership share. So, um, you know, you bring so much ownership share to the table, uh, we're gonna give you this payment. And this payment is increasing in the size of your ownership share. Um, so the larger ownership share, the, the larger the side payment that you get. 
And what this is doing is it's putting everybody in a symmetric position. So now once you've turned it over and you've gotten your side payment, now we've got a completely symmetric situation and we can use any of the standard auctions to uh, allocate, to, to find out who's got the highest uh, value and award it to them. Um, so that was the, that's the next step, which is this, uh, this auction where uh, you pay your bid and you, um, you pay your bid uh, less the, uh, uh, the average payment of the others. Um, and there, but there's actually lots of mechanisms we could write down. So really any standard auction, once you've done this step, which uh, basically puts all the parties in the same position, um, then any standard auction is going to give, uh, in the symmetric environment is going to give um, full efficiency. Okay, so let's see, there was one more thing I wanted to say about that, I think. Oh yes, I know. So th then it turns out, you know, this is very interesting. So all this I was, did as a doctoral student uh, at uh, Stanford, but then uh, years later, so back in, um, when did it start? So uh, I don't know, around, um, 2006, I think it was around then, or no, maybe more recently than that, uh, 2010, uh, I don't, or 2012, maybe it was 2012, so eight years ago. Um, so another problem came up that turned out to be identical to this. Um, so the ICANN, the um, International Regulatory uh, body that rel regulates uh, internet domains like .com, .gov, .edu. Um, they basically uh, decided that it actually makes more sense to have uh, more top level domains. So they, um, what they did was they said, okay, if you want a top level domain, you, had, you, you uh, apply uh, for a top level domain. And, and we can think of many that would be uh, valuable. So like dot book, uh, Amazon might be interested in that um, uh, given that they're in the business of selling books um, or dot car for uh, an auto dealer or uh, dot gay or dot, uh, you know, anything. There's, there's lots of them. Uh, dot law for lawyers, uh, you know, what, whatever. Uh, there's an infinite number of them. And so the ICANN decided, well, we shouldn't have, you know, just anything. Uh, we should have, um, you know, a, an expanded set. Um, and so let's just get people to apply for a particular uh, top level domain. And then in the event that only one party asks for it, we'll just give it to them. If multiple people uh, apply for it, then we will um, hold an auction to determine uh, who gets the domain. Um, so, so that's what they did. And they said, well, we don't want, we know about the FCC and the problem that they had with too many applications. So we wanna make these application, the application very expensive. So what they did was they, they uh, so, so you submit an application and you, you pay the application fee. And the application fee, uh, if I remember correctly, was $85,000. It was a lot of money, $85,000 is a lot of money to have that car. Um, but it turns out these things are worth millions for good ones like dot book and dot car, um, dot movie, all, all these things we could have. Um, and companies might actually like them like dot Microsoft, dot Amazon, um, dot Apple. They, they actually, all these companies did apply for those top debt level dot domains. Um, and it was interesting because, um, you know, things like dot Amazon, uh, the, uh, the, 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 
the people of South America along the Amazon uh, applied for it as well and uh, claimed that it belonged, that they had a better claim on it than some uh, company in the United States. And so, and this was fought out, this big legal battle. Same thing with Dot Apple. So the Apple growers um, applied for it and fought Apple for the Dot uh, Apple domain. Um, if it, you know, Dot Microsoft, then Microsoft had a much stronger case, but Apple and Amazon actually had a pretty weak case. Um, ultimately, uh, I think Amazon did get uh, dot Amazon, although it, it took many, 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 many years of fighting. I don't even know if it's resolved yet. Um, I, I, I can't remember. But in any event, this was, uh, uh, th th this was the situation. So, um, so after they had this app, there's the application deadline and then everybody applied. And so hundreds of people, so, so actually thousands of people applied for hundreds of uh, top level domains, uh, each paying $85,000 for every domain they applied for. And this is where I came in. Because now there's, so I just got a phone call from somebody saying, you know, that, that, that this was a, ICANN was going to, it had this process and then they were going to do an auction uh, in the event that multiple people applied for the same uh, domain. And like, and, and it happened quite a bit, like dot app, 13 people applied for dot app. Um, most of the, you know, dot book, there were, uh, six or eight people that applied for dot book, even though they're, they're paying $85,000 for each application. So I got this phone call and they said, you know, you're a, you're an auction guy. So do you think you can help us in um, uh, participating in the auction? And I said, well, actually, I'm not that interested in helping you participate in the auction, but I am interested in constructing a mechanism uh, that's better than what ICANN's doing. And that this was, you know, really in my wheelhouse. So, so what I ended up doing was um, uh, uh, constructing a private auction that would take place um, among the applicants to resolve the issue before it went to ICANN. And the ICANN actually encouraged me to do this. Um, and they, you know, formally in the rules, they said, you, you know, we, we actually, it's perfectly fine for you guys to resolve disagreements, you know, the 13 people that apply to dot app, if they can resolve this among themselves, then that's just perfectly fine. We're happy, we're, we're, we're happy for you. Otherwise, uh, we're gonna hold this auction and we're going to collect the revenues from the auction. And you might think, well, that, you know, certainly that, that should be better. And then they get the rents, but the problem is I can't already get so much rents from the fees that they charge, they don't know what to do with the money. Is they have tons of money. The last thing they want is more money. So that's why they they propose that you know you guys should really just work this out among yourselves. So you know I knew exactly how to do that. We just wrote a paper on this, and you know a long time ago, this is almost twenty years later, that I have to dust this off, and and uh, and, and here you go. But but I I created this private. Uh, uh, auction approach that basically implemented uh, this. So essentially, it was it's more sophisticated than this because what the guys would do is they would they would come together, they would all agree. Oh, we're going to participate in um, um, what we call the applicant auction mechanism. So we, so we created this company, the uh, uh, and this uh, approach of the applicant auction and. Uh, if every applicant for dot app uh, decided to participate, so we got unanimous agreement among the 13 to participate, then we would hold a uh, simultaneous as uh, uh, ascending clock auction for the um, uh, for that domain and any other domains that they brought, let's say, so, 
many of the parties own many uh, domains. So we would actually do them together if possible. Um, in this simultaneous ascending clock auction, which would identify the party that, that valued it the most. And then that party would, um, uh, would, would, would pay the, wherever the price stopped in the ascending clock, would then pay that amount to the other guys. And it was all equal ownership because everybody had a one over N uh, ownership share. And uh, that, that was the mechanism. Well, it turned out that about uh, that, that almost all of the app, all, all, almost all the applicants did this private approach and about 95% of them did this through our private auction. So it was actually a huge success. Um, but a very, uh, you know, nice direct application. And in fact, uh, we wrote a paper on this. We experimentally tested it and, and wrote a paper on the whole thing. Uh, I still haven't published the paper, but I really should because one of the co-authors is Bob Wilson. So maybe this gives me, uh, inspires me to, and, and you can see the paper uh, on my website. If you uh, just click on auctions, then it'll be uh, listed there as the applicant auction. And there's actually lots of videos about it. It was very hard to convince the participants to participate in this. You might think it's, you know, obviously this is, it's better because you guys get to collect the revenues as opposed to, uh, give them to uh, uh, ICANN. Um, but nonetheless, you know, everybody's in a different position. And so it, it actually took a lot of work to uh, argue, you know, conferences and arguing with them and lots of back and forth. And we had competitors. There were, there were lots of competitors uh, providing alternative uh, private auctions. Um, but, you know, we literally just got almost 100% of the market. Uh, because our approach was so rock solid, uh, and, uh, and and so so that was a lot of fun. Um, so in the future, ICANN should uh, actually not you know should actually have a, a, a better process and not uh, uh, do it this way. You know, with, with have the money, but they really have this problem with it. They it's very difficult for them to spend money because um, uh, there's so much disagreement about how money should be spent. And so, you know, this at least has the property that they, um, uh, they don't get too much money, although they did get all those application fees. Um, so, uh, and, and I guess they do have some need for money. Well, that was a little bit of a digression, but um, it's just an interesting application that, that, that you know, this theory can all of a sudden uh, come out to bear on a real important problem. And this, this is, you know, lots of money are involved. This is, you know, many hundreds of millions of dollars uh, was spent on these top level domains. Um, so it, it's a, it's, it, the, the, the stakes were large, very important. And it was, uh, it was good to be able to step in with something that actually worked well. Now I should say that the, the more broadly, the impact of this paper, um, the broader impact of the paper is with respect to trading in general. And so if you think about trading of commodities, um, there is almost always in, in mature um, commodities markets, lots of forward trading and the forward trading tends to put parties in more balanced positions because that's the way they can manage risk. And what this theorem says is that's a really good thing because the more balanced position they're in, the less incentive they have to misrepresent private information in the spot market and the, or, or equivalently, the less incentive they have to exercise market power in the spot market. Um, and that's, the, that, that's actually another important insight that we didn't fully understand or maybe didn't understand at all when we initially wrote the paper, but it quickly became transparent to us once we started looking at commodity markets 
that uh, that this is really you know this uh, removing asymmetry through more balanced positions reduces the incentives to misrepresent private information or exercise market power, and thereby reduces um, the um, the market failures that otherwise would occur. Any questions about the mechanism design and the uh, Meyerson Satterthwaite and dissolving partnerships before I uh, jump to our next topic? Okay. So what we're gonna, and I'm just gonna give a few words of introduction and then we'll uh, stop for today and we'll pick this up on um, uh, tomorrow, Tuesday. Um, but what I'm gonna talk about is auctioning many similar items. So, and this is a very natural segue from the discussion of commodity markets to auctioning many similar items because that's exactly what you're doing in a commodity market. Uh, and this is a very important uh, area. Uh, I'm just gonna scratch the surface uh, in my remarks, but, but essentially the, um, when we look around, this is where most auctions take place, uh, certainly auctions of great significance. Uh, yes, there's the eBay auctions where we're auctioning uh, single items. Yes, there's Sotheby's and Christie's where we're auctioning uh, a sequence of single items that are, that are quite heterogeneous, but most of the auctions in practice involve auctioning lots of very similar items. Um, thinking of treasury bills, uh, uh, stock, uh, telecommunication spectrum now is much more of, uh, we can split it up uh, in frequency and uh, auction uh, many identical uh, blocks, which is what we do today. El electric power, uh, gas, emission allowances, all these things, auctioning many similar items. So lots of applications. Each of our standard auction forms has an analogy in, uh, an, an analogous extension to multiple units. So in, instead of making a single bid or offer, uh, in this case, uh, if we're talking about forward auctions, which will be mostly what we talk about, um, where there's one seller and many buyers, um, the, uh, the bidders will sit, submit demand schedules. Um, and there's basically three forms. There's pay as bid, which was the traditional treasury practice in the United States and still is the, the practice in, in many countries. Um, there's the uniform price, which the United States moved to in um, uh, 1989, I'm pretty sure. And uh, that was, uh, Milton Friedman argued in 1959 uh, that the uniform price would be a much better choice for treasuries and so advocated for treasuries then. And he was right, uh, it is much better and, but it took the uh, uh, treasury uh, quite a while to, to realize that and essentially a, a big scandal uh, that uh, the Solomon Brothers scandal uh, that I'll talk about later. And then the third is, which is analogous to that, well, actually the uniform price is very similar to the second price auction and it can be implemented when, in, in a world where everyone has a demand of uh, at most one, then uh, so single unit demand, then there's a version of uniform pricing that's identical to the second price auction. Uh, when parties have multi-unit demands, then we have to do something differently if we want to get the dominant strategy result of the second price auction. And that is what I call the Vickery auction. So lots of people call this the VCG uh, auction for Vickery Clark's 
Groves, but I hate acronyms and Vickery did this work uh, much before Clark and Groves. So, so I just call it the Vickery auction. <clears throat> um, so in all these, each bidder submits a demand schedule. And here I show a um, bidder one's demand schedule, which is a step function, which says it's, it's, it's basically their mapping of it's what demand curves always are, the number that they want as a function of price. Uh, but economists uh, put price up here, I guess, because price is really important for economists. Whereas an engineer would flip it around and uh, do it the other way. If you want quantity as a function of price, then price should be down here. But we'll always do it this way, the way economists do. Now, and the same thing for each of the bidders. And what the auctioneer is going to do in all of these standard forms is form the aggregate demand, this downward sloping uh, aggregate demand curve. Um, uh, typically when we do an auction, then we actually uh, require that the demand curve be downward sloping um, because that's generally consistent with uh, reasonable bidder preferences. And so it's uh, generally required. Um, and that actually helps in, with respect to uh, uh, incentive compatibility. Uh, if, you, if you actually know that their preferences have a particular form, then you basically want to forbid people from uh, doing things that are inconsistent with that particular form. Uh, so th that's, that's what we do. Now, in the instance where uh, the good isn't lumpy, where we can actually uh, have the quantity adjustment, uh, where quantity is very teeny, then um, we'll often actually have them represent their preference with, rather than a, a piecewise constant function, a step function, we have them express them as piecewise linear functions. And, and that's what we do in electricity markets where electricity is finely divisible. It's what they should do in uh, financial securities and other commodity markets where you don't have this lumpiness. But uh, we haven't evolved to that state yet. So that's what the demanders do. And then we basically uh, cross this with supply to determine the uh, clearing price and to determine the winners. And so in the pay as bid auction, the, uh, everybody's gonna pay their bid, um, but all these auctions are gonna work the same way. We're going to take the aggregate demand curve and cross it with the supply curve. And the supply curve doesn't have to be vertical. It could be a supply curve like this, but it's their intersection is gonna determine the clearing price, which separates the winners from the losers. And all the standard auctions are gonna have that form. Next class, I'll look at the other auction forms. And most importantly, we'll look at about uh, how the different pricing rules impact behavior. And, imp and, and, and which is going to affect both who wins and the prices paid. So it's gonna affect efficiency and revenues. And that'll be our focus of our uh, class tomorrow. But for today, we've reached the end so unless there's any other questions, I will stop here and we'll pick it up tomorrow. Any questions? I don't see any in the chat, but anything? Okay, well, let's stop then. And uh, we will resume again, uh, 4 p.m. your time tomorrow. Thank you very much. <clears throat>